So, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. So, if we look at the results of the poll here, let's just end it and share the results. Mm. So, very interesting. <laughs> hey, Martin. Are the marketing people um, happy? <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <Didn't> just. <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting. Look, editorial, editorial was quite up there as well. 40 yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I have to speak a lot then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm actually. It's interesting to see this is quite a. It's actually quite an even split given you know overall numbers. Yeah. It's it, really it, interesting. Yeah. So thanks everyone for filling out the poll. Um. So, um, we have quite a wide variety of people here today. We know that we have some international people and we also have some teachers in addition to students and publishers, which is fantastic. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to our fantastic lineup of speakers who I will introduce shortly. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to give an introduction to the Society of Young Publishers um, as we have organized this event. Um, so, the SYP is a voluntary organisation aimed at those in the first 10 years of their publishing career, as well as others who work in allied industries. Our volunteers are a mixture of students, entry-level publishing staff and mid-level professionals across a broad range of functions who dedicate their spare time to helping others take their first steps into the, in into the industry and from there to progress within it. Established in 1949, the SYP is open to anyone already in or looking to get into publishing or a related trade. There are currently regional branches in Oxford, London, the Southwest, North, Scotland and Ireland, as well as a UK committee who oversee all of our national operations. And this event is specifically run by the Oxford branch, the SYP. Um, so the SYP organises a number of speaker events, ranging from regular standalone panels, where a topic relevant to the current publishing scene is discussed, to skills-based workshops and masterclasses. We also offer a wide selection of digital content, such as webinars, blog posts, podcast episodes, and video mini-series, mini um, particularly over this past year for reasons well known to everyone. Um, this output equips our audience with the tools and knowledge to get into or ahead in the publishing industry. SYP members are entitled to a number of benefits, um, including access to the SYP toolkit and the SYP job board, exclusive member invite event invites and eligibility for prize giveaways and also a broad range of discounts. So for more detail about what you can get from a membership or how to join, do check out our website. So moving on to today's event. Um, so as you know, this is the introduction to education publishing panel. Um, educational publishing has been more vital than ever of late with the impact of school closures around the world vastly altering the education landscape. And thus the role of publishers has had to shift to in order to provide the best support possible to teachers. This session will provide a complete overview of the education sector of the publishing industry with talks from four fantastic panelists who span a broad range of professional backgrounds. From publishing for UK schools to global English language teaching, we aim to showcase roles in a range of departments and the different routes you can take into education publishing. So we have a wide variety of speakers joining us today. Um, if you have questions at any points during the webinar, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and we will aim to answer them throughout or towards mm -hmm. the end. Um, so now I'll introduce our four lovely panellists. Um, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Um, so if you could just briefly introduce yourself and your role and we'll start with Prem. Hi everyone, um, my name's Prem. I work as partnership manager um, within the UK education sales team. Um, my main role is I relationship manage uh, multi-academy trials and groups of schools and support them with curriculum, resourcing, professional development and group purchasing. Okay, thanks, um, we'll move on to Carrie next. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Knox. I am a senior marketing manager in the UK primary team in the Oxford Education Division of Oxford University Press. Um, and I oversee the marketing strategy for our portfolio of math resources uh, and math professional development for primary school teachers. Um, and now Dan. Uh, evening, my name is Dan and uh, I work at Garnet Education. We're an independent publishing company uh, based down in Reading and uh, I'm an editor there so uh, what an editor will be doing is working with the manuscripts that a writer is uh, producing 
for the books and uh, feeding back and getting the manuscripts into shape and then uh, taking the manuscripts through design, through the production process, working <coughs> uh, with the photos and the audio recordings and, uh, uh, and things like that. And finally, Elon. Hello, I'm Elan. I'm a senior product manager at Pearson and I work in the primary team on the uh, and I work on the extended curriculum. So everything that's not English and maths at the moment. And, and I um, work closely with the PED professional development team, but I am mostly working on teaching and learning product for children and teachers and parents to uh, work on to support uh, primary kids in their learning. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so you've kind of started to answer this question, but first of all, um, could you kind of give us an overview of what types of resources you publish and who you sell those resources to? Um, so we'll start with Dan. This time. Mm, OK, well, um, yeah, I mean, Gar Garnet works a lot with uh, ministries of education in the Middle East. And so uh, they will come to us and um, tell us what types of books they want for their um, for their students, so uh, we work with primary uh, primary age books uh, all the way up to universities as well. Uh, we've got some open market books, general English as well, and um, and there's lots of other things that uh, the company is doing. Uh, but there's also uh, digital ebooks as well, and um, a lot of online components and materials. Um, we've just recently um, started working with uh, a platform called Quizlet, so that we can uh, provide uh, online materials um, for learners and teachers as well. So it's a broad range, it's, it's a bit of everything. Great, um, then we'll do Elan. Well, uh, yes we do, uh, well Pearson do a lot of stuff, uh, um, but the stuff I'm working on and I'll talk to is, as I said, for teaching and learning resources for teachers and children and parents in primary school. We do, uh, I don't work directly, but I work very closely with my colleagues in the director learner team who support, you know, stuff like revision guides or materials for children and parents to work on at home. Those boundaries have definitely blurred a lot mm. recently. And mm. I think the idea of having separate teams, we kind of find ourselves looking across going, we're doing the same thing. So, yeah, it's all about uh, primary age kids directly. And I think the thing there is that where it's more connected to formal learning, that's us and the, uh, the stuff that teachers try to formalize, where it deviates off. Um, we support that in other ways, but I'm more around the formal learning uh, materials uh, for primary, but we also work, I also work quite closely with uh, on the resources for early years and more for me uh, at the moment on Key Stage 3 up into Key Stage 4 colleagues to look at that whole journey from 5 to 19 to give that um, a consistent and useful uh, learning resources for everyone. Wow, quite a range. Um, great, so staying within primary, we'll move on to Carrie. Yeah, similarly, um, OUP published sort of across, um, really across the range. So I'll, I'll stick to maths, which is um, where my focus is. Um, we publish a range of maths programmes, um, anything from textbook programmes to digital maths programmes. It, it really depends on the kind, the, the way different schools and different teachers would like to teach it really, um, which is why we have, you know, quite a wide portfolio. Um, and we also sort of, we also offer professional development that goes alongside that. Um, um, and I imagine Prem actually will probably be adding to this as well. <laughs> um, but actually picking up on um, what you just said, Elin, there's also now, as you say, much more of a merge between um, school and home. And obviously, I think homeschool links are already a hugely important part of what we're looking at and, and something that we really want to support. And after this year, um, yeah, even more so. Um, so, yes, we, we do also have separate teams that focus on the home market. But increasingly, we are we are joining up and looking at how we can either support teachers with remote education or how we can support parents who are trying to, you know, teach from home. It's It's been quite a year. <laughs> Yeah, to say the least. Um, <laughs> and then finally, Prem. Yeah, so following on from what Carrie uh, is saying, um, OUP publish uh, a huge range of resources um, from international academic, but what I, uh, the department I work in solely publishes for primary and secondary. And um, what they range, the, the range is from print textbooks, 
uh, specific programs or schemes of learning to uh, digital products as well. Um, and a lot of what we're doing is following from what Elan was saying is at, at the moment, our main focus is that five to 19 journey as well. And the home learning following on what from Carrie said as well, because like Elan said, the lines are getting blurred. And in terms of the support that we've provided conventionally, which was going into schools and supporting every, everything has just all the departments are just working together to ensure that schools are supported, teachers are supported, and parents are supported as well during this period. So yeah, that's that's an overview of what we do. Cool. Um, yeah, so staying on that thread, then, as we've been talking about homeschool links a lot, so obviously COVID, had to say the word, bring it up sometime. Um, so it's obviously had a massive impact on everything, but particularly on school closures. Um, so how has your work changed in response to school closures around the world and the continuing impact of COVID? Um, so we'll start with Prem. So you can continue your thought. Um, our main role is because of uh, us, look, our team for solely focusing on multi academy trust. A lot of the individuals that I meet are CEOs, directors of education, curriculum advisors, etc., or, or um, heads of CPD for the whole trust. Um, a lot of the time you would have meetings face to face, uh, going to visit them in school, um, visiting the teachers. But obviously now everything has switched to virtual. And actually we are finding because of that, there's a lot more opportunity to have those appointments that where they were working full time in schools, they would never have the opportunity to have. So all of our meetings have become virtual which has been great. So it's given us um, a lot of opportunities that have opened up there. But we also attended a lot of events where we would use that as an opportunity to network with um, teachers or schools at that event. Uh, and a lot of the institutions and teaching schools that I've been working with have converted those uh, events to virtual as well. So it, it's been completely different. So attending those virtuals, not having maybe a stand at, at an exhibition centre, but doing a presentation online or sharing your desktop and demoing any resources that we've got. So I think we've just all become a bit more agile in our working and adapted to what the customer wanted, basically. Great. Um, so Carrie, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the the thing I'd add to that is the pace of keeping up with changes um, is definitely something that has, has been in marked contrast this year. Normally, we'd all know roughly what school year looks like and what teachers and pupils and, and parents are kind of expecting in each term. Um, and of course, in the last year, everything's been changing sometimes on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So our focus, our focus is always on supporting teachers. Um, but what that looks like, because of because what teachers need at the moment is it's just I mean, it is amazing what teachers have have done in the past 10 months. Um, but because the expectations of them and the demands on them have been changing, you know, some, sometimes DFE guidelines have been coming out. A few days before they've actually had to implement them so a lot of that has been so a lot of what we've been doing I think has been trying to um to find ways that we can support them with remote learning and education with bubble teaching with you know um with anyone who uses our resources resources matching those resources to the latest DfE guidelines the latest DfE expectations the latest you know and sometimes there's a very short period of time that that can actually be done so there's um, you know, our, our publishing teams have been fantastic in, in pulling that together extremely quickly. And then our, our marketing and sales teams have, have been trying to get that out to our, our customers and communities as quickly as we can, because, have, I mean, yeah, it's no, yeah, I, I realise that there's no point saying what a year every time because we know this. But, um, but yeah, basically trying to provide toolkits and content and matching guides and things for, um, for our teachers and also wanting to be, I suppose from a marketing perspective, wanting to be very mindful of our tone. Um, because it's what teachers are, are being expected to do this year is uh, so extraordinary. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's the main change. Um, yeah, just pick up on one acronym in case people weren't familiar, the DFE is the Department for Education. So thanks for picking up um, on that. <laughs> I'm sure it will come up again. So just rolls we off the we'll abbreviate from now on. <laughs> um, cool, so uh, Elon, how have you adapted to the challenges of COVID? 
Well, without repeating any of the uh, great of those comments, all of that's true. Absolutely very well said to both Prem and Carrie. I think the thing I would, I suppose, I think we all instinctively wanted to be supportive and, you know, most of the publishers started to make stuff available for free and start to try and flex and be, you know, support schools in the way that they wanted. And I think... For me, it was really exciting because I was still relatively new at Pearson and um, we were able to do something quite unusual. We'd got a, a, a worked on a transition project, which is anyone's worked in primary or in, uh, on content around primary and uh, key stage three, actually creating resources for the transition area where money and who's going to spend money on it is quite difficult. And actually to be able to do that was actually really exciting and we got something done super quick and we got really good feedback from the market and but also really um so as an opportunity to play and work with teachers and i say play even though it's, it's a difficult situation it's still well what is going to work because we didn't know and we were looking ahead and i think so that was exciting and i think the other thing i'd mention is that um we've i think like everybody uh, been trying to get our heads around the idea of Live teaching, live remote teaching, asynchronous, hybrid, all these terms have started popping up, defining behaviors. Now, I work in primary where generally kids are fairly mobile and, um, you know, there's a bit of herding cats aspect, aspect. And teachers have really been struggling to make sense of what the guidance from the government and what they're meant to be doing. And I think that's been while it's been very difficult and obviously there's lots of hard stuff about the situation in a way it's been one of the most exciting periods because you really have to listen there are no simple answers and the only way you'll know if it's worked not like what you did last time is whether someone actually bloody uses it and that's the best fun about making content and stuff for schools is if you get it right you make a difference to some learning in a classroom and it's not what we did last time or a textbook that sold last year it's only if it worked this during this blim, blimmin, um epidemic. So it's been fun. I, I use that word not to mean I've enjoyed it, but it has been fun because we've really had to play and think. Yeah, so true. <laughs> it's a year unlike any other. Um, <laughs> so, um, Dan, how about you? I mean, um, just on, on a personal level, it, it's completely upended. Um, things for me I, I started the role that I'm in now in March about a week after the lockdown began <clears throat> excuse me or just a few days actually so I went from working in an office nine to five surrounded by my colleagues having meetings in person etc uh, to just working at home which is where I am now obviously and uh, so I haven't actually particularly met any of the people I'm working with it's all been through zoom I haven't met them sort of face to face apart from when I had an interview um, so that's been interesting because that's it, it's showing you that you can do this uh, this, this type of thing um, but also, I think from um, from the company's perspective as well of, of what we're doing. I mean, uh, what I didn't say at the beginning was that um, Garnet is an, an EFL publisher, so we're publishing textbooks for people that are learning English as a foreign language or a second language, and um, and and so uh, to, to pick up a point that Prem made a couple of questions ago about supporting teachers and supporting um, uh, parents and and that kind of thing, I think we're putting a lot of our, of our efforts into that as well. So the company is also a teacher training uh, institute. Um, we've, you, we've turned our social media into um, guides and resources to help teachers. We've, you know, we see a lot of teachers going online and saying, you know, how can I do this? Can anyone give me any tips on that kind of thing? Uh, running lessons uh, in this way, teachers are guiding each other and helping each other or turning to each other. Uh, and so we're trying to help those as well and support them. And, um, and, and, um, Elan, you were saying that um, there's lots of new things that you're uh, developing uh, with teachers. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I was a teacher myself. I was a teacher for 15 years, and it's only in the last couple of years that I've come in-house into publishing. Um, but as a teacher myself, picking up a book from every single publisher, everyone had a different website or a different CD that came in the back of its own portal for online learning and different resources and extra resources. And, you know, for a teacher that doesn't have that much time and is now in this situation, um, of having to learn on their feet uh, a lot of times sometimes it's just it, you just don't have the I don't know what the word is but um you know to learn a new system a new portal and get your head around something it, it, it's really it's hard sometimes you've got so much to do already uh, and so I mean one of the things that Garnet has done as I mentioned earlier was uh, partnering with Quizlet so that's made it very intuitive for us to to create content that works with that platform so instead of 
creating a whole new system for teachers to get their head around, they can easily tie in with what's out there already. You could use something like Slack, for example, um, in your classroom, and, and you know we can create the content that works with that platform so that teachers have something that's easy for them to use and they know, and it's not learning a new clunky system. Um, so, so that's kind of what how it's changed my my work and, and uh, my perspective. I mean, I said when I had my interview, having been a teacher, that I, I always felt that teachers were kind of a little step behind. The students are quite far ahead technologically and teachers are quite traditional. And I think they like the book and they like um, the way that they know how to teach. And I think probably teachers are, they've had to flip that. And I always saw that coming down the road. I, having, I worked in South Korea for 11 years, which is a very technologically advanced nation. And everybody had phones and tablets and stuff in the classroom. And I could kind of see that coming down the road and, and it's come a lot quicker um, than we all expected. So that, that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, so Dan, you mentioned that you were a teacher. Yeah. Um, so we've actually had a question from the audience. Um, yes, so they're asking, yeah. how can you get into education publishing and do you need teaching experience? Um, I don't think you do need the teaching experience, no. I mean, not everybody that I've worked with um, in education publishing um, has been a teacher. Most of them have, um, but not everybody has. And, and um, I suppose it would depend on what particular role you want to be in as well. I mean, if, if it's editorial, um, I think teaching experience definitely helps uh, because, you know, if you're taking, a manus taking in a manuscript from a writer and you can see that you just know from whether you would pick up a book and uh, and teach that yourself you would know whether something is uh, is going to work or not uh, in a classroom uh, and just having that knowledge of, of what it takes for people to learn um obviously different uh, and the market would be different as well so um yeah having a bit of knowledge yeah is is definitely helpful it's not exactly necessary but to get into education publishing um obviously you can look around at places like linkedin that advertise jobs um there are obviously online editorial um, associations, uh, SYP, for yeah. example, um, things like the um, Society of Editors and Proofreaders that will advertise uh, jobs and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, look around and see what, what, um, uh, what jobs you can find and, and try. Uh, um, it took me a while, actually, to get into in-house publishing. Um, I did work freelance for a little while while I was teaching, um, when I was in Korea but to come back to the UK a couple of years ago it took me a while to get in even with all my experience and uh, uh, things so it really it's perseverance as well just keep trying yeah great um so Carrie could you tell us about how you kind of entered into education publishing whether you feel like you need to be a teacher for your job I don't think you do need to be. I mean, I think as a marketer it is good to have an understanding of your market very much like you were saying Dan um, and I think there are there are lots of ways that you can get in touch with your market. But the way, um, actually, similarly, I, I applied for about ten jobs at, a, at Oxford University Press after university, and I didn't get a single interview. <laughs> um, so I then found a job uh, doing affiliate marketing for mobile phones. Very different, um, but it did give me the skills that I needed, the marketing skills that I could then build up, so that when I later on went back to apply for Oxford University Press. I did then get interviews and I did then um, manage to get a role in the primary team. Um, so I think, I suppose there are, there are two elements. If you're, if you're looking to get into marketing, um, then firstly, being able to build up your skills somehow um, is really useful. Um, and secondly, having an understanding of the market. Um, and actually, um, Elin, to pick up on what you were saying before about listening and the importance of that. I mean, we've always, you know, we always do a certain amount of market research, but even this year in the I know we're going back to the same question about um, COVID, as you would. Um, but actually this year, there's been so much more sort of temperature checking and litmus testing and and I suppose much more social listening and trying to be far more in touch with our market. And actually, that has been a really, really brilliant thing about everything else aside. It has been great to get much closer to our market. So that, that's what I'd say from a marketing perspective. I understand the market. And if you are, if you're already... Um, if you're already in marketing, then that's the main thing. If you're looking to get into marketing, um, because of course you can apply marketing to to anything, and that's actually kind of why I went into it because it is a transferable skill. Um, and I, think, I suppose I was applying for jobs um, in the wake of the financial crash, so there was also that at the back of my mind at the time. Um, but I think if you're looking to get into marketing, then 
an understanding of content channels reporting those would be the main um, and you can apply those to anything if you if you're working on projects if you're part of a theater group or or, or a band i realize they're terrible examples for this year specifically um or if you if you have a mate who has a startup in um scented soaps or the most random thing i could pluck from my mind um if there are ways that you can demonstrate that you have an understanding of those skills if you're not yet in a marketing role then that's what i'd advise or set yourself up as a freelancer even that would be my top it's worth <laughs> great really useful advice thanks um so elan how about you how did you get into education publishing what advice would you give there's two things there i'll do the uh so how did i get into it well i was a primary teacher and uh, uh i have the probably the most un helpful and untransferable story as to how I got into publishing. Uh, there was an advert in the TES and it said something along the lines of, <coughs> I paraphrase, do you have opinions about te use of technology in schools? If so, talk to us. And I thought, great, someone who wants to hear all my opinions, I'll just rant <laughs> at them and I won't get a job. I didn't really expect a job. I just thought it was a publisher fishing for information. Uh, turned out it was a job interview and I was uh, ended up working for a some medium-sized publisher who was then bought by a bigger publisher. And um, yeah, suddenly I was in, right? So um, uh, an unusual route in, but I think everything that uh, Dan and everyone said about um, uh, the connect, you don't need to have a, so the advice to answer the advice question, um, you don't need to have a education background. I think you do have to come to terms with the fact that you're going into educational money, money, uh, educational publishing. You're never going to make the big money. This is you don't do this for you don't do this because this is where the excitement is. It's education sector can be slow and frustrating, and there is a um, I could go on about the downsides. The point is you do have to have something that makes you stick at it and love it. I do it because I'm, I've tried other sectors. I've worked in corporate e-learning. I've walked on the edges of those things and got there and went, nah, doesn't smell like my territory. I don't want to be there. It's fine. It's great. I can do it. I didn't love it. But if you've got to wake up every morning and come to a series of meetings and work on things that are going to take up your life, you've got to care a bit about it. And um, I do it. I generally do it for the teacher that was me in a classroom, pissed off because um I felt like the publishers weren't doing things for people like me and I wanted someone, I wanted to know that there was, how do I do that? That I wanted to publish for, for that person, the frustrated teacher, busy, tired, feeling like they're not getting the help they need and they need it. That's why I do it. But you've got to be driven by your own, you know, what, what pulls you through the hard days as well. So your own route. Yeah. Absolutely, completely agree with that. <laughs> um, so finally, Prem, what, like, how did you get into education publishing and what advice would you have? It's been actually great to hear the rest of the panel because mine will summarise it nicely. <laughs> um, um, mine's completely random. So I started in investment bar uh, banking with Barclays and I used to be a relationship manager, look after high value portfolios. Then I went on to lead an uh, investment management team so earning loads of money. And then um, I decided to have a family and took a, a bit of a, a couple of years career break and decided to support at the local primary school. Got a job there, which was ideal because my son started um, school there and I led the Read Write Inc project. It's a phonics program that Oxford University uh, Press publish. So I was leading on that intervention program and the o Oxford University Press secondary consultant came into that school and I was sitting there while she was doing her spin. I was like, I could do that job. I've got, I could do that job really well. Um, and just by coincidence, um, a vacancy came up for a secondary consultant in my area. So I live in, in the right in the middle of the territory that I was working in. Um, and I got the job at Oxford University Press. Um, but I think my advice would be going back to what Dan was saying is that the main thing is, what is it that you want to do? Think about what you want to do. Then you can target different publishers, sign up for job alerts, etc. But go, going back to what Alan says, uh, said lastly, and I think that's the most important from earning a huge amount of money at the bank 
I, as I grew up, let's say, I, I found out that when I got up in the morning, I wanted to make a difference. And, you know, when they say, be the change that you want to see in the world, that's exactly what I did. So for me, I want, I had young children. I wanted to know what was going on in the education market. I wanted to support them, but I wanted to de- actively be part of it. I think working for Oxford University Press has allowed me to do that because their mission's great. Everything they do goes back into the work that they produce uh, for, for the next generation. And I think for me, that, that, that gets me up in the morning. And I think when, when you choose a role, whatever role you choose, just make sure that your values are tied with it. And because I think you get up every day happy and excited about doing the role because it means something to you. And that's cool. well, I, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I didn't really sort of touch on what I feel out of it when I, I spoke earlier, but uh, definitely it's, I know that what I'm doing is helping someone somewhere or hopefully, fingers crossed, it will. Um, and, and that's the one thing that I really got a kick out of when I was a teacher. You know, I used to teach in a university and, uh, you know, in, in Korea, the kids go through this high school for 10 years and everything's drilled into them that they must memorise English. And it's, a, and it's this thing they've got to memorise for, uh, for an exam and they've got to know all this ridiculous grammar like TOEIC and TOEFL and everything and then like splurge it all out on this one-shot exam when they're 18 and that decides their future, basically. And, uh, and then they came to my classroom. I worked at a language university and, and I really wanted to um, sort of frame my classroom as a bridge from that world of this is some kind of language that you just memorise into using it. And um, so I, I created my classroom around my students practising what they'd learned instead of just memorising it, but using it actually like that. And I still get occasionally emails. I got one um, just a couple of months ago, actually, from a student who just graduated. And she said, four years ago, I was in your class, 2016. It was the best class I ever had at that university because... I met friends and I gained confidence and things like that. And I, I think of that when I'm editing something or I'm changing something or, you know, you're looking at a reading passage or, or, or certain activities in, in the textbook. You think someone, somewhere, this will help them, I hope. And if I can do that with the book like I used to do in my classroom, then, uh, then yeah, you know, it's not for the money, but it's for the, uh, the enjoyment of doing it. I mean, I actually, I actually fell into um, publishing, uh, in a sense, um, just by knowing somebody who had become a publisher and I actually was on a cigarette break actually I used to smoke and I, I was in a, a bar in Korea the only bar in the neighborhood that um banned smoking there was no there wasn't a smoking ban there's this guy he was Australian and he, he didn't want anyone smoking in his bar so I went outside and somebody walked past that I knew and, and I hadn't seen for a few years and I said hey how's it going what are you doing and all this kind of stuff and we swapped cards and and then uh, a few days later I saw her again and, and she said oh I've been thinking about what you told me about working at a university now, I work for this publishing company and we're going to do a book and we need somebody that would kind of help us um, to do something. And normally I, I would have gone, oh, cool, and would have waited to be heard from. But for some reason, I, I just, I was forceful and I started emailing going, yeah, that thing you told me about, you know, did, did anything, is anything coming up? And um, actually that thing didn't come up, but uh, she said, we need copy editors, can you do that? And I had to Google it. And I went, well, that's basically what I do in my classroom. When my students write essays, I basically copy edit. So yeah, okay, I can do that, and uh, and that's how it all began. And that was nine years ago, and uh, and here I am now. So. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think don't don't think that I say this to my eighteen year old daughter that don't think that once you decide to do something, that is you for life. You're yeah. you, it's not a life sentence. Whatever you want to do. It. Yeah, what's that, Carrie? It's not. It's not a life sentence. It's not. And I said you can change your career so many times, going to different things that you know you feel passionate about. So don't think that you're in this box and you have to stay. And that's why I think think about what is it that you enjoy, and then just go, just just go with it. Don't think, oh my, oh, I'm not really qualified to do that. I don't think I've got the skills. Generally, skills are adaptable. And you can adapt your skills, whether it's communicating, negotiating, to any role, um, even if it's management. Once you know how to manage people, you can go into any company, really, and do that. So yeah. just yeah, don't restrict yourselves, I think. just. And, and to the teachers listening, the teachers, in the, you have... You have uh, moved 30 children around in a space and na- navigated that trust me a boardroom is a piece of bloody cake after that N- most adults you will meet 
uh, and that you have to work with in the workplace. You you have all of those skills. You have the the only thing that most teachers don't have is the confidence to try it, to to use it. Once you bring your classroom self, not with the telling people what to do. Obviously, they people don't like that, or put, you know making them put their hand up to go to the toilet. But the other stuff, you can do it. And you know, so uh, you know, definitely. You know, obviously we need more teachers and I'm not trying to encourage anyone to leave the classroom, but don't, if you, if you do choose to come into publishing, you have got loads of transferable skills and um, it just takes a while to realise how many you've got. I find it so fascinating, even though we all have different stories, they all kind of also come down to the same thing, that it's doing something for the right reasons and doing something that really lights a fire in you and that, that you feel passionate about. Um, and I mean, yeah, affiliate marketing for, for mobile phones was not something I was passionate about. Um, there's only so many times you can talk about quad core processors before you're going to go slightly insane. But but building up the skills, I mean, yes, there there is pursuing what your passion is and finding ways in. Um, yeah. And I think, Carrie, you know, going back to what you said, sometimes when I was 18, my life changed drastically and the path I was going didn't end up happening. And, and when you're young, you don't really know what you want to do. When someone used to, you know, when people used to say to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, don't know. I wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> but and then, and then after I became became a teacher I thought I'm not staying in this box I want to be something else yeah. <laughs> so you know I think definitely it's like you say Carrie just 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 uh, the world is your oyster there's still times I think I might retrain as a teacher and I'm so on the fence and so it's kind of interesting that we're sort of having yeah I know so it's, already, it's so interesting that we're now having conversations about moving one way but yeah it, I, yeah it's the best job <laughs> When it's great, it's the best job. I mean, publishing is great, obviously. I say, which one but, are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, when pub no, publishing agree. is more generally great, but when teaching is good. Anyway, I think, and I think, I just someone asked on the chat. Uh, someone, Sarah said, I'm struggling to think of ways to adapt my teaching skills into publishing skills when applying for jobs. And my response was, communication is at the heart of teaching. Adapting the message to lots of different people, right? That's what we do in publishing. You just do it at, at a different sort of scale. It's the listening to your audience, uh, understanding their needs. It's a, there's a lot of transferable stuff. Absolutely. It's, quite, yeah. it's the same with marketing, that it's, it's a, very often it's a message that people don't want to hear or don't want to engage with, much like teaching, that, you know, from the limited teaching I've have done. It, it, you often needed to persuade people to get on board in the first place, but it was actually something that you genuinely believed was, you know, important for them so yeah, there is a huge amount of transferable school, even with, even with marketing as well. Yeah, I, mean, I would say that um, if you are, if you have got teaching skills and you want to take them into publishing, there's a lot of things you do in the classroom, which you would do on the page as well. Um, so if you know you're, you're going to try and explain something to your class, and I'm talking from an AFL perspective, of course, but if you are going to try and explain something to the class and they don't get it, then for your next class, if you're going to teach that class again, you're going to go back and edit and trim and make it into something that the students would get and you're going to find the best way of doing that and you and you can sort of do that with publishing because you, you know it doesn't just happen it's not just one version of a book it goes through several mutations several permeations i should say um where you take the first proof stage and it goes through six or seven different versions uh, as well so you can see how things look on a page you can try uh, an exercise um as well and then if it's not working then you change it um, so, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of things that you do in the classroom live that you also do on the page. Yeah. And was it was it Sarah who said that, Elan, on the chat? Because I can't see. Yeah, that. it was. Yeah. yeah. Sarah, you know, when we got, when we used to go, when I used to be a secondary <clears throat> consultant and go into schools, when they knew that you had experience or they're speaking to uh, one of the consultants that came to with me was a teacher, that they know that they're speaking to someone who understands their perspective as well and have been there. So they, they, they actually respect that a lot more, knowing that they're not speaking to someone who's just going to be selling to them, but someone who understands what's going on in their classroom, the challenges they face, um, et cetera. So for sure, you've got loads of skills there that you can transfer over. Yeah, great. So, yeah, there are lots of skills, obviously, that you can transfer from teaching. Um, into education publishing, which is fantastic to hear about. Um, so kind of thinking of like students and other publishing hopefuls and so on, um, what skills would you say you found most helpful in your career that they might have from a non-teaching perspective? Um, 
Dan, did you want to say something else? Sorry. Oh, it was just to tag on to the the previous question. Was uh, what we're talking about with Sarah is that um, it's just just I've just remembered that actually the Garnet, <laughs> Garnet Education website we've got a podcast uh, called ELT Time, and uh, there is an episode, uh, one of the most recent ones about that kind of thing. So I've just remembered. So that might be worth Great. checking. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, that's great. Um, so do you have anything to say to that question about like what skills you found most useful in your career um, that people who haven't been teachers might have as well? Um, I, well, for me, I think it changes all the time. If I think about which skill I particularly uh, have, and because you're using so many different ones, not only as a teacher, but also um, as an editor of a book as well, um, <clears throat> excuse me, working on things. Um, I was very much, um, very much when I went into publishing, um, somebody oriented on details. I wanted, <clears throat> sorry, I wanted uh, the page to be really great. I wanted to be, everything to be perfect, you know, um, the sentences as tight as it could be. Um, but then I think what I learned through publishing is that you've got to sort of step back as well and look at the bigger picture. And I got sort of reminded all the time, like, don't dive straight into the little details, but step back and look at things. So I think an ability to be flexible, adaptive, and also, you know, look at things differently to how you do, I think is definitely something that I um, have learned to have to do. And I think that has become a skill now because I find my, I catch myself sometimes looking at something straight away going, this is what I would do as a teacher. And then I've got to catch myself and I go, right, you know, let's actually go back and, uh, uh, and look at it differently. Um, so that's something um, that I am finding useful at the moment. So if you've got that ability to to look at things in different ways, then I think that would be very helpful uh, from an editorial perspective. Mm, great point. Um, Elan, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> uh, the question was sort of about which skills or particular... Which skills have you found most useful in your yeah, career? Yeah, I... Um... I wrote quite a lot of things down here, but I think I'll go, I'll go with one. I'll go with one, and then see where it goes. I think if the when I not long after I left teaching, so I think I was at that publisher for a, I don't know a year and a bit, still being all cocky and everything. Uh, and I went to a there was a sales training event, and I was like, oh, I don't do sales. And my boss said, You're going, and I was like, Oh, well, I don't need to. And I sat there being all sarky for the morning, really. Saki and I look back on I want to slap me already um, and actually it was one of the best bits of training I ever had because I realized number one that I was bringing a ton of prejudice to the sales situation and ultimately when sales is done well and when it's done well and I mean that's not to say it isn't sometimes done badly but when it's done well all it's about is about connecting somebody with what they need with what you've got and if you can do that and if you can have a good conversation then what's wrong with that? And I realized that are then, you know, like things like I've, there's not a bit of edu of the publishing work that I've done that I haven't found something interesting about because it's something to do with getting help to teachers that we said at the beginning. So I've even got, I, got, I get quite geeky about uh, project accounting. I don't, I'm not good with numbers. I'm really terrible with numbers, but it matters to get that stuff right. But the sales training really did wake me up because I realized I was bringing a lot of assumptions about what I could and couldn't do, what I thought those jobs were and how they connected. Actually, they're all kind of important. Um, but um, yeah, so I'd say the skill is to be open-minded to uh, the mm -hmm. different parts of, of the publishing work, work and product work um, more generally. Yeah, good advice. Um, how about you, Carrie? I'd, I'd agree with, both of you actually very much that adaptability I suppose if it comes down to that adaptability has been something that's been hugely important um I remember hearing um a teacher uh, say at a conference last year probably um that the uh, some of the students that are being taught right now aren't going to go into the jobs market until 2050 and that absolutely blew my mind um but just because you know it I still feel like the 90s was yesterday but anyway in terms of what skills they will need, what, what it always keeps coming back to is, you know, flexi flexibility, adaptability, skills that can be transferred. And I was thinking, but that's very much the case for us now as well. I really think that actually a lot of, a lot of um, the willingness to learn and to learn new platforms, new IT skills, very much new IT skills, um, new, new ways of learning and new ways of approaching the same problem to keep it fresh. Um, 
that that adaptability I think is is hugely important and actually another thing just to give a, a you know a harder example um data science actually I definitely went into marketing um as a confession imagining it would be a little bit more like Mad Men than it actually is and marketing is much more and it's fascinating I love that about it it's but it's much more about data science and tracking and how can you improve <laughs> Uh, performance on something and actually I think that is very much you know for those of you who are teachers I think that is very much you know teachers have to deal with data all the time assessment data attendance data um school improvement data all this kind of stuff so it's 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 actually all the same thing it's all a very much transferable thing a transferable skill looking at the performance of something working out how to improve it and then checking did that actually improve it okay what do we need to do better next time um but very much with sort of a you know so having a data hat on is something I think is um a really really good a really important skill so true also that 2050 fact blows my mind right <laughs> <laughs> i can't cope <laughs> um so prem how about you What's... all of what carrie dan and elan said i would say um but for me i think relationship building and the communication factor and a the the ability to build rapport I think going back to what um, Elan said, um, honestly, there's so much of a misconception about salespeople when people say, oh, sales, oh, no, definitely not. I'm not having it. Exactly what you did when you went to that conference. And I always say to them, um, no, because it's how you do it. A, a lot of ours is not like a car sales sales. We've done the sale and we're out of there. For, for me, actually, and it goes back to the value basis, it's, it's building a relationship with the customer and that and it's based on mutual respect and trust so that every time you they need something the first person they think of is you so you know when, when I was a consultant I know that a lot of this uh, a lot of the heads of department that I worked with then are still in touch with me now in this new role and I think that's a lot of that's got to do with the relationship that I built with them so those those skills I think, uh, but in any role, not just sales, relationship building and adapting back to what Carrie was saying um, make, makes a huge difference. Because I think going forward, um, that that's what actually ha- gives us long standing customers. Um, once you've built that long lasting relationship, they know no matter what, I can go to that person. I can trust the advice that they're going to give me and I'll, I'll be confident in using it. And also going back to what Dan said, I think self-reflection is very good. When, when you do a, a role, always looking at, obviously, when you're looking at a customer, the, uh, the spectrum is that huge. Not every customer is exactly the same. And I think when you go into a call sometimes or a meeting and you're thinking, initially when we started the role, you're thinking, oh, I didn't match my my personality to the person sitting across the table. And I, and I think the ability to go away from something and think, well, actually, what could I have done better? Did I go into that direction a bit more? Was I pushing in that direction and they were going straight ahead? You know, I think the ability to constantly re- uh, you know reflect and look back at what you did and then you know, you can improvise or you can do it a bit differently later. So that, that I think that's quite important. Don't be too hard. Yeah, classroom. That's probably where I get it from as well. <laughs> because uh, I, I, used to teach the, I used to teach four classes, the same book, four classes, different times of the day. But I'd get, you know, three, the three o'clock class would go amazingly well. And but then at five o'clock when the day's over and the, the classroom's cold because they've turned off the heating and the and the hoovers aren't outside because we had the last slot of the day very different experience so you know you often find that that went great in that class and then I tried again and it didn't go so well and then I would do it again the next day I used to work on a Thursday and a Friday so the Friday classes I would have reflected on the subway going home and, and come back and, and change things and that didn't work so well or, or tweak things and reflected on things and yeah that definitely is um yeah, and, and be open. Don't be hard on yourself because I think that's that's how you grow and get better at your role as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so some really great tips in there. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite the audience now to ask any questions that you have. Um, so we do have a couple sitting here now, mm-hmm. so I'll ask one of those. But if you want to open up the Q&A and ask anything relating to what people have said already, or if you have anything new, um, please do so. 
Um, so we've got someone asking, are there any graduate opportunities in education publishing? Um, I've been an English tutor for five years now and realised I used to edit and change up online resources I'd find all the time to suit my students. Um, so yeah, graduate opportunities. I'm pretty There's... sure at Pearson we've got uh, graduate apprenticeships and all sorts of, there's all sorts of, I know at least two people who are on the graduates, graduate schemes into publishing. Uh, I don't know exactly the route. I should have prepared. Really sorry. Um, but please hit me up on LinkedIn or or any of the, or Twitter or whatever, and I'll I'll follow up. I'll try and I'm sure it's really easy to find. But we have we have those routes in. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there must be. Yeah, similarly, there are intern there's an internship that AUP runs. Um, and similarly, I, I remember thinking about this this morning, and then I didn't actually go and find the link. Um, but yes, there are internships. There are there are entry level jobs um paid some of them are they're mostly oh, yeah. Pa yeah they're paid they're not internship yeah. come and do it for free sorry That's not it, that yeah. bad <laughs> no not yeah well there's a lot of things climate. like um uh, editorial assistant roles as well and i see that a lot on linkedin um uh, entry level roles as well um uh, yeah I, I don't know the exact route for graduates but um there are there are ways in perhaps without being a graduate as well i mean i recently went to a webinar um I forget who did it actually. I, I was I meant to look that one up as well, and um, it was it was about what you've just mentioned in the second part of the question about um, editing materials, um, and and how to do that effectively for reading materials. And uh, I think it was I think if I remember rightly, it was ELT Publishing Professionals, and they are uh, an organisation which uh, connect publishers and freelancers. Uh, and so that there's an opportunity as well. Um, so you don't necessarily have to get on a graduate um, placement, but there are opportunities as well if you are doing that kind of thing. The ELT Publishing Professionals is one to look at. Can I also give a shout out to all the other non-commercial uh, publishers that are out there? So the, the huge number of arts organisations, the heritage sector. I'm a trustee of, uh, of an arts organisation in London and there are shed loads of people doing educational publishing and there's loads of ways, it loads of routes in. If, if the commercial publishers is a bit of a difficult, you know, you don't find a way in there. There's lots of different ways in to get experience of the publishing process. And um, I think it's a really, it's a really diverse and fun part of, of, of educational publishing and definitely worth checking out. Oh, and there's, there, there are agencies who work for those. So there's people like Edcoms. So there are more secure businesses as well as um, uh, doing that freelance or just for the charity. There's, there are more secure jobs there available. That's a really good point. There is, there is actually a huge, um, it, there's a, actually quite a vast sector once you start digging into it. Um, I'd also add um, that genuinely um, signing up to a recruitment agency, much as I was quite scathing of it, at the beginning of my career I think at times um, especially times like now when you you know you might find that um, business is struggling and that they might not be recruiting or you might not find as many roles going at the moment but the same amount of work still needs to be done so I think there are a lot of companies at the moment who are freelancing things out or who are um, getting works out to temps it's just a way in the door it means that you get a, you, you know you find a way to to make contacts um it's and, and similarly, I think I mentioned before, if you can set yourself up as a freelancer and if you can offer services that way, um, again, it's a way of making contacts. It's a way of um, building up a portfolio as well, um, even if it's not even if you're not um, solely working for the education sector, even if you're, um, again, working for this startup that makes scented soaps or whatever. It, if, you, if you can set yourself up as a freelancer and build up that portfolio, build up those skills and build up a network, um, then that's definitely something I'd recommend. Yeah, sure. I, that, that's how, actually what I started doing after I first fell into um, education publishing. I fell into something like I didn't, didn't really want to get into it. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> uh, setting myself up as a freelancer. Um, yeah. I, I worked for a few months with a publisher and then they stopped using freelancers. They were bought out and, and they stopped using freelancers. And so I realised that I wanted to do this. So I, I went to um, a company called the, uh, the College of Media and Publishing, and they ran a proofreading and web editing um, online course. And so I did that. You get a diploma, and, uh, and, and the last module is setting up an action plan for the next year to become a freelancer. And um, having had some university summer holiday time, I actually did it in about a month, and I ended up working for quite a few publishers. Uh, this was in Korea, uh, but also ended up working for magazines. I worked for Korean Air 
um, their magazine on the planes for about six months. And I worked for a sort of music and lifestyle magazine. And I went out and interviewed like famous musicians. There's a guy called Dan Deacon, who's got the same name as me, the American techno musician. And I interviewed him and went to his concert in Seoul. So um, yeah, definitely. I think um, that there are ways of making the work for yourself as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. It definitely takes a bit of a leap of faith, I imagine. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for, for myself, I'm quite quite introverted. So you're always advised, you know, send out emails to people and say, oh, you know, you saw a mistake on a website and email them and tell them, and then you can prove that you know things. And I never, I always found that uncomfortable. I didn't really do that that much. But once you've got one or two people that want to come, want you to work for them, then it all builds up, it snowballs and you get confident and you, and you get networks, as you said, and, and contacts yeah. and, and you can do that. And I did that for well, six, seven years before I, I went in-house a couple of years ago. I will add to what I said because I remember actually when I first left university and a lot of people simply said to me oh just use your contacts to get a job and I remember finding that so annoying because I didn't have any and that was part of what was so difficult so so actually to second what you said Eileen if, if, if anyone wants to um, add me on LinkedIn then please do same I think we're gonna yeah, yeah, same. If anybody has a question, yeah. Then, yeah yeah so I'll just try and squeeze in one more question before <laughs> we kind of wrap this up um because we've only got a few minutes um so Sorry to anyone's question who I don't pick, but I'm sure any, everyone will be welcome, like, happy for you to contact them afterwards if there are any questions oh, yeah, we don't yeah, answer. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just pick one. So um, I really like the idea of relationship building being a core skill needed in education publishing and totally agree with its value. Given we are all working from home, how do we build and maintain those key relationships with teachers? Um, so Prem, I wonder if you want to start with this one. Yeah, um, I think for us, um, it's a keeping in touch, not necessarily having virtual calls with them all the time, but we're touching base with them. Um, as Carrie was mentioning, um, this year, uh, it's all been hands on deck. And we've had loads of stuff like free resources and free trials. We've had um, um, extra CPD webinars that we had done that teachers could join. So we use that as an opportunity to consistently keep in touch with our uh, customers, either email. Um, and there were some where we look after key accounts. We would book regular monthly catch ups, virtual catch ups, just to catch up where they're at, what support they need and what, what else that we could do to support them in that. Every month it changed. Um, the first month it was all hands on deck. We need resources. We need to set up our digital resources. So what we would do in my role is help make that happen. So if a school or a trust came to me, I would speak to our digital teams, our marketing teams, our primary, secondary sales teams and support them virtually that way. But I think a mix of the two, keeping the comms going uh, via email and um, touching base and supporting them where they need it and having the virtual face-to-face -face catch ups as well. Great, does anyone else want to add to that? I'd really briefly add that um, I'd never heard of Zoom before this year, but there are so many online and virtual, <laughs> there are so many online and virtual communities that, that have actually really blossomed in the last year and I think it's it's been a really great way to um to share experiences to to share advice to share so actually looking for that online community that um that has what you need that you can also contribute to that's that's also um yeah something I'd add to that uh, and whatever uh, platform that's on sorry yeah so obviously there's stuff on twitter there's primary rocks for primary there's all the subject hashtags yeah. so you can watch those conversations happening uh, you will know so you will know a teacher find a teacher talk to them let them rant at you you'll hit you get a flavor that they, they don't need much encouragement they just don't think anyone wants to hear it um and you'll have teachers <laughs> or have yeah, them. yeah and the last thing i wanted to say is sometimes that you're not being a teacher um is the valuable thing and actually you can bring different perspectives and one of the things I don't think we've really had a chance to touch on is um, dare I say it publishing so white we're very it's a very um, non-diverse sector right on the whole and um, um, I remember when I started at a, a large publisher I won't na name it you can see on my CV um, that someone described me as being exotic because I was male and not from a traditional British background and I was thinking how am I how would you use that word? Anyway, the point is, it hasn't changed. I know it's got better, and it's a, that's quite a while ago, but there is a tendency of listening to the same voices 
and we don't always look much beyond it. And there's a lot of homogenization, which is natural. It's part of the British way, make everybody like us, but actually bring the difference. So don't, you know, ask the difficult questions, bring what it is that you've got to offer because hell we need it because the same solutions aren't going to keep on working. So it's really important. Amen. Right. Um, so if anyone else has anything else to chime in, you're welcome to, but otherwise that was a good final word. But no, okay. Or did you, Dan, sorry. No, I, I can't follow that. I mean, I think I think you've all touched on the points that I was going to make anyway. Um, I, was, I was perhaps thinking that, um, you know, maintaining the key relationship with teachers, I, I was thinking to say, well, you know, maintain them with, the, with colleagues as well and people that you also work with um, is another thing, um, as well as other teachers. Um, but yeah, no, I was stunned into silence by uh, the answer there. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> but uh, I, do, I do agree with it though. I, I do think that particularly the AFL publishing industry is, uh, is lacking a little bit of the diversity and it does need it, so yeah. Mm, completely. Um, so yeah, um, thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the lovely speakers. Um, and thanks everyone for your questions. And I hope you enjoyed this panel. Um, so if people do have any questions, where can they find you afterwards? So, so I would say the best place is if we post, should we post it in the chat? Our, yeah. our people that put in our Twitter handles and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. yeah. People can just connect with us and just drop us a message and we'll answer your questions. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Great, so I'll let you just drop your links in now and I'll just do my little ending spiel. Um, so um, I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. If you did enjoy it, we do also have an upcoming webinar on the 10th of December, which is about publishing across borders. And that's all about translation rights and international fiction with speakers from Bloomsbury Academic and other stories and pairing press. Um, so I'll drop the registration link in the chat in just a moment. Um, but that's also free to attend, much like this panel. Um, so you may be interested in that. Um, you might also be interested in joining next year's SYP committee. So committee applications are currently open for the Oxford branch and all of our other regional branches and the UK wide branch as well. Um, so applications do close tonight at midnight. However, you only have to write 200 words. So don't be put off by the kind of quite short deadline um, from now. And we have like quite a wide range of roles, including communications, inclusivity as well. So we're looking to diversify within the SYP, um, just picking up on what we were last talking about. Um, you may also be interested in organizing events like this one. Um, and we are hosting the uh, biannual Oxford SYP conference next year. So you could be part of the conference subcommittee um, if that's something of interest to you. Um, so I'll just drop the links in now. Um, so you can also just follow the SYP on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook um, to keep up to date with our upcoming events and all our other content, which also includes a podcast, which I can't remember if I mentioned already, but that's got some really useful content on how to get into publishing. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to our panelists and yeah, good evening. <laughs> to you all thanks, for us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks thank very you. much good yeah. luck it's been really enjoyable take care thank you thanks bye everyone bye